Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Pravinda Jita, and welcome to this webinar on designing offshore structures against uh, extreme events. Sorry, I'm like, it's, it's. Okay, so in, in general, when we talk about extreme events, we are actually also talking about accidental events. And the main design philosophy here is to basically maintain the usability of any escape ways on an offshore structure, uh, maintain the integrity of any shelter areas, and of course, maintain the global load bearing capacity in addition to protection of the environment and the local economy. Some of the extreme events that we'll talk about today include pushover analysis uh, against extreme load, uh, wave loads, ship impact, dropped object, and blast loading. In general, uh, when you when we for these type of, uh, types of accidental events, uh, there is a lot of large plastic strain that uh, that occurs due to these large loads. So to analyze and design against these events requires software tools which are capable of predicting any dynamic inertial loads. Uh, in other words, if you have a blast load or a dropped object. And of course, when you get large deflections, you've got to take account of geometric nonlinearity. And of course, uh, you'll also get yielding, in which case your, your software tool should also account for any material nonlinearities. Uh, SACS, uh, for most of you SACS users, you know that we have a module called Collapse. And, and basically what this allows you to do is to design uh, against some of these extreme events. And uh, some of the uh, features behind it basically are it allows the gradual development of a plastic hinge through the me member cross-section. I'll talk about how that's done in a minute. It also allows the development of plastic hinges anywhere along the length of the member. Other aspects like local buckling, joint flexibility, joint failure, and member rupture are also uh, taken care of. And in addition to that, the collapse also accounts for the nonlinear elastoplastic pile foundation behavior, any global and local buckling. As I said before, joint flexibility, joint plasticity, and joint failure. And the users can define their own strain hardening curves. Uh, in other words, in, in the past, we used to have a bilinear curve. And you'll find right now, you can define any sort of uh, yield curve by using semi-linear uh, lines. And of course, uh, we also account for any residual stresses resulting from unloading. What that means is part of the structure is elastic and some parts are plastic. So the elastic portion, they'll want to get back to the original state. And these will be resisted by the plastic uh, areas, which are gone plastic. And therefore, there's an inbuilt uh, load in this uh, structure. OK, so now, how do we allow for hinge formation anywhere uh, along the member length? And basically, what we do in collapse, we subdivide the member into eight subsegments. Uh, that's a default. And of course, we can go up to 20. And what we do is we monitor the stress level at each sub-element as we increase the load on the structure. Uh, hinges are not restricted uh, to the members or the center. In other words, if you do this, what you're doing is you basically, pre if you limit the hinge development at the ends and the center, basically what you're doing is you're predefining the failure mechanism. And of course, this is going to yield the, the, the wrong uh, answers. Because uh, depending on the stiffness of either end, the hinges can form at other locations. And as you'll see later on, the actual plasticity spreads across the member and is not located at discrete points. So any software out there that treats the structure with three hinges and sort of locates them at the ends in the center is basically going to give you an approximate answer. 
Now, the development of the hinge uh, through the cross section is, is taken into account by subdividing each uh, section type into what we call sub areas. And in this case, for a tubular section, what we do is we subdivide that into 12 sub areas and then we monitor the stresses in each sub, sub area. And as soon as that exceeds uh, plasticity, we make the whole sub area uh, sub element uh, length elastic. We do similar things for other in collapse for other section types. And again, these are all divided into little sub areas to ensure a gradual formation of the hinge through the cross section. And like I sort of said, the, uh, the length of the member is also divided again. The hinge can form anywhere along the length of the member. Um, Parvinder? Uh huh. One question uh, from uh, Sadhan Toei. Is it 20 sub element for any length member? Yes, it is. It's, it's a default. Default is 8, and the user has the option to set it to anything between 8, well, from 1 to 20, basically. But we found that setting it up to 8 gives you uh, it's a good number for results and the optimizing your run time as well. Okay, so as I said, the plate uh, is also divided into thicknesses. In, in general, this is five sublayers for each plate, and this basically allows the plasticity to develop through the thickness of the plate in a gradual manner. Now, for a pushover analysis, again, uh, this is a this is a typical pushover analysis, and what you're seeing here is our new collapse viewer, which shows everything in a fully 3D rendered mode. And again, as you can see, the plasticity is not confined to the member ends. It actually spreads across the member. And I'll show you a still shot in a minute, which shows this. And again, you, what you can also see is here is the capture, uh, collapse captures the buckling uh, of each member uh, nicely. And here you, is, I've taken a still slide here, and, and you can see the plasticity is now kind of spread across the member in some cases. You know, it it's kind of varies. Uh, it's not confined as in the drawing down here, the ends and, and the center of the if you had this again, what you are going to do is you're going to get an approximate solution, uh, which is not going to reflect uh, what's going to happen in reality. OK, so now looking at dynamic analysis, uh, again, we're talking about ship impact, dropped object, and blast loading. Uh, these are kind of transient loads, and therefore you get a very large load being applied, and then you get a response of the structure which could cause failure. So to test for survivability and to account for uh, any inertial loads, uh, our methodology collapse is to basically take your model, uh, generate the modes and the mode shapes and the frequencies, do a modal analysis. And then what you would do is you would run it through the SACS dynamic response module which will conduct a full-time history analysis. This, in general, will output a file which now contains your inertia loads at each time increment. And then once you have that, you can run that through collapse to do your full linear analysis. And therefore, you account for all the inertia loads uh, for that event. Talking about ship impact, uh, in this case, uh, to design against a ship impact analysis, basically what you have is you have a vessel of a given mass which is traveling towards the structure uh, at a velocity. And the design basically involves uh, uh, ensuring that the structure can actually absorb all the kinetic energy from the vessel itself. And some of the energy will go into the localized 
plastic deformation, uh, which is called denting, as, as you and I would call it. Uh, there's also going to be elastoplastic bending of the member, uh, elastoplastic elongation of the member due to the large deformation. You might also have some fendering devices, which will also absorb some of the kinetic energy. And of course, there's a global deformation of the entire structure and, and also included you can also include some ship deformation. We have the DNV uh, ship deformation curves or, or already built into collapse. So if you use this, you'll get some sort of an indication how much energy goes in, into the deforming the ship itself. Now, to do some, one of these analyses, what we recommend is basically uh, you uh, mesh the member being uh, impacted and the reason to do that is basically what you want to do is you want to account for any uh, local indentations in, in this case I'm playing with this member here on the right hand side and you can see the plastic uh, area developing here has been meshed using plate elements and as, as we increase the load, you'll see the plasticity is spreading. Uh, and the different colors basically mean, uh, sort of reflect the different amounts of plasticity throughout the thickness of each element. And again, like I sort of said, by doing this, what you are doing is you're actually counting for the local deformation, any reduction in moment carrying capacity as a result uh, would be taken account of automatically. And therefore, you'll get a, a much better uh, estimation of the load carrying capacity and the energy absorption capacity of the structure. Now, in, in the past, uh, I've come across problems where the impacted member has been uh, basically modeled as a beam. It's a, just a single beam element. Now, when our the users have uh, attempted to do a ship impact analysis on that, they found that the structure survives. And, and that's largely because the local indentation hadn't been taken into account. So once we meshed that leg and then conducted the ship impact an, uh, analysis on that structure, we found that the actual structure actually collapses and doesn't survive. Now again, in, in uh, API, you'll find some approximate equations uh, which account for the energy absorption of the dent. What that doesn't account for any is any geometric effects, in other words, any loss of moment carrying capacity uh, in that member that location. So it'll give you uh, an estimate on how much energy will go into the dent, but it won't actually account for the dent itself. So therefore, we recommend that you actually mesh that uh, impacted member to get a proper estimation of impact load. Okay, so this was a dynamic ship impact. Uh, again, as I described, what we did was we passed the, ran it through our dynamic, dynamic response module, and then subsequently we took the inertia loads and pushed them through the collapse to ensure survivability. And the graph on the left, the, the blue line here, is the ship. And basically, as time increases, the ship uh, is heading towards the structure, which is the black line here. And at a certain stage, the ship impacts the structure, and the structure starts to vibrate. And then the, uh, the vessel is then pushed off, and the structure continues to respond. The graph on the right shows the modal responses, the various mode shapes, uh, participation factors, or the participation of the various mode shapes in, in the total response of the structure. The next item I want to look at is dropped objects. Uh, certain locations on a offshore structure, such as the crane loading and drilling areas, are often subject to dropped objects. And basically, uh, we have to design uh, structures to survive the initial impact from the dropped object. And it also has to meet the post-impact cr criteria to survive a one-year environmental load in addition to the normal operating conditions. 
Another reason why you might want to design for dropped objects is to determine safe lift heights. In other words, if you are actually modifying the uh, structure, in other words, adding equipment or taking off equipment, what you want, uh, and the, the platform is producing oil or gas, whatever, and you don't want to shut down production. So what you want to do is determine the safe lift heights in case you drop the structure and nothing serious is going to happen. And again, when we drive, uh, do a dropped object analysis, is very similar to a ship impact in that what we have to do is we have to ensure that the structure being uh, impacted or with a, the object drops can absorb all the kinetic energy from the actual uh, impact of the object. In other words, if you that's a very simple formula, as I've learned in, at school, uh, basically based on the mass, gravitation, and the height of the dropped object. To do for, if, if I was to do an analysis of a typical deck, uh, what I suggest here again is that you go ahead and mesh the area which is going to be impacted. In this case, you'll see that everything is, uh, the deck is modeled using plate elements. And the area being impacted, I've, uh, we put some refinement in there. You can increase that if you like. And, and not only that, what we've done uh, underneath the deck itself, all the beam, the main beam elements or the girders or the beams have also been modeled using plate elements. And the reason for this uh, is that during an impact, you're going to get a lot of deformation. The cross-section of these beams is going to Distort, and you want to account for all of that. Uh, make sure you account all of that deformation when you uh, look at the absorption capacity uh, of the structure. If you don't do this, what you can get is you can get uh, a very, very conservative result, which will basically give you the wrong uh, safe drop height. And this is a typical dropped object analysis. Again, all this area has been meshed. And it's the same uh, uh, model I just showed you earlier on, where everything underneath the structure has also been, uh, the beams have also been modeled using plate elements. And you can see some plasticity developing at the bottom. Again, this is a dynamic analysis. Uh, and you can probably see slight movement here uh, due, due to the transient uh, afterwards. Next item, I want to look at talk a little bit about blast analysis, and basically the uh, primary object here is designed for personal safety. And if you have a blast, you also want to make sure that you have financial considerations. A parvinder. Uh huh. I'm sorry, just uh, real quick, in regards to the dropped object analysis, I have one question. It's saying, are the beams meshed by sacks, or does the u user have to do it manually? It's uh, it's actually quite easy to do that. It's uh, Right now, the sacks doesn't automatically mesh the beams, because they could be any configuration. And, and generally, what you have to do, let me go back, and I'll show you how easy it is to mesh some uh, something like this is that what you would do is you would basically do uh, one element wide model here. In other words, you would just take one element, uh, just take the whole length or the width of the deck, and again, model the little beams here using a single element. And then what you can do in SACS is you can extrude that, that mesh down the whole length. So it's is fairly simple to do. It doesn't take a long time. Something like this will probably take you about 10 minutes. Yes, but right now, you would have to do this by yourself. But we are developing a few capabilities or meshing capabilities. At some stage, we will use for you. So going back to last analysis, as I said, the main reasons are for personal safety. You want a controlled shutdown. Obviously, financial considerations and 
considerations. Now the API RP2FB specification now requires a ductility level uh, last design for what they call low probability high consequence extreme events. Uh, a ductility the level blast uh, now design requires what we call dynamic analysis to account for the initial loading and also the large deflections uh, geometric and material nonlinearities. And of course, you, you, know, you require the DLB design, temporary refuge, safe mustard areas, and escape routes. And in SACS, uh, Basically, there are, uh, you, can, you can design for any shock waves, and in this case, there are two types of sh uh, blast waves. There's a shock wave, which is a sudden pressure rise, uh, and there's a pressure wave, which is a gradual pressure rise. Uh, shock waves result from explosions from materials in liquid or solid form, extremely energetic vapor uh, clouds. And basically, the way you would design this in SACS is to use linear increase or change in pressure, and you can have multiple linear curves to design any profile. And here we have an idealized profile. The line on the shows the Again, you would do this through the dynamic response, which accounts for first time history analysis. And to say, for example, if you want to design a uh, last wave, uh, last wall wave, again, we recommend that you mesh that wall using prime elements. And again, uh, the process is very similar. What you would do is you would do a single element uh, uh, modeling across the width of the structure and extrude it the other way to get the whole last wall. So once you have this, then you gain, can go ahead and do all dynamic analysis. This is, uh, like I said, like this is again, as you can see, the structure by the transient. Once you, uh, once the this is the last wheel, and you can set the structure. The next thing I want to talk about is our new our trans collapse now. One one uh, more question. Somebody was asking about if those were um, beam elements or shell elements uh, that are used for the meshing. These these here are plate elements. Uh, again, these are, this case is a quadrilateral element. What I recommend personally is that I would use triangular plate elements, and the reason for that is a lot of the quad uh, quad elements they have a restriction. In the fact that when when you get a deformation, the four joints have to be, can only be out of plane by a given amount of uh, given tolerance. If that tolerance is exceeded, the elements don't give very good results. Now this is not just for SACS; it's a general FE sort of limitation. If you have a triangular plate element, the three joints are always in a plane, no matter what deformations you make. So. Even though you see quadrilateral plate elements here, what I would recommend is that triangular plate elements to get a better answer. And and that's the same for the uh, dropped object analysis, correct? That, that was the same for the dropped object analysis. Uh, same if you're also modeling stiffened joints or non tubular joints or tubular joints because of the intersections that you have. Members that you can get uh, quads not being in the same plane. So a anything that is either curved or requires large deformations, I, I would say that you use. And do you have an estimate for this uh, runtime for these uh, blast analysis and the dropped object analysis? Right. The computers are pretty fast these days. So I mean, if you takes five minutes. Uh, surprise for some of these. It will be used. So that's just a regular procedure. If you really refine it, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, so you're not really talking about 
hours are different. So going down to the enhanced claps, what we are done uh, to the current claps is we've added new capabilities. The current claps is basically large diffractions, in other words, you know, second order strains, jerk, uh, which are being used to generate your stiffness and a geometric stiffness matrix. Uh, what we've done to the new claps that's going to come out later on this year is we've also added what's called large rotations also known as core rotational approach and what that allows us to do now is to actually uh, predict extremely large deformations in addition to that what we've also done is what we've added what's called the arc length approach which now shows you any unloading that might occur in the current collapse module that you see, if there is unloading, what we do is we actually skip from a, that local uh, maximum point to the next equilibrium point. We actually jump across the unloading portion, which is what happens to a structure in reality. So when you get snap buckling, it actually jumps from one position to the other. It doesn't time spent in between unloading is a dynamic phenomenon. So basically Parvin, I'm sorry, I'm I'm gonna have uh, to butt in here. A, a lot of people are saying that your uh, mic is, is uh, hard to hear, so I don't know if you could adjust it um, in for this slide and, and repeat. Okay, so can can you guys hear me now better? Is That's that better? better? Yeah, that's much better. Okay, so as I was sort of saying, we're uh, introducing a new CLAPS. Uh, I don't know if you guys heard that in, in our slide. And we've made some major enhancements to it in that uh, the previous CLAPS uh, module only contained large deformations. The new CLAPS module now also accounts for large rotations. And basically, that allows us to now to predict extremely large deformations. The other enhancement we've made is that we've included what's called the arc length approach, uh, which basically allows us to predict any unloading. In other words, when you get a failure, uh, what the structure, there will be a slight bit of unloading, and then the, the, the load path will change, and the structure will start to pick up load again. In the current collapse, what we do is we jump from one stable equilibrium position to another. We don't actually show the unloading, even though that occurs. And, and that's basically what happens in reality, is that the, 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 if you have a structure where you have a, a failure of a member, it's going to jump from A to B. It's not going to slowly unload and then go ba back up. That unloading portion is a dynamic phenomenon. But it's nice to see that so the user has some sort of an indication that something has happened to his structure. Uh, what you see here on the uh, here is a basically a simple frame, and what we've done is we applied a load, and we're looking at the elastic response here. This is the elastic response, and basically, we have the load increasing, and then you get a maximum load, uh, and then basically you get a decrease as the structure fails. Uh, this has been compared with other theoretical approaches out there, and as you can see, the enhanced collapse gives extremely good answers compared to some other work out there using other approaches. Just to show you a, exactly what happens is the, the, the figure on the left is the old collapse, which is what you have right now, and the, the animation on the right is the response you get from from the new enhanced collapse, like I sort of said, this is going to be out later on this year. Similarly, this, this is the actual response. Uh, as you see, the old collapse actually fails at the peak. In other words, you have a global limit point. After that, the structure is unstable. And, and basically, we don't give you the unloading portion after that. The new enhanced collapse will also give you the, the loading portion, and after the 
the structure sort of buckles, the arc length iteration approach takes over and will predict the unloading. And, and lastly, the other feature that we've added to the enhanced collapse is the ability to predict uh, lateral torsional buckling. Um, a lot of programs out there don't account for this. And when you're talking about really large deformations and you have beam elements in there, there's a high, high likelihood that you're going to get a, a, some sort of torsional buckling failure as well. So the new enhanced collapse will also predict that. And, and basically, that kind of brings me to the end of this uh, presentation. And what I'd like to do now is hand you back to Muj and uh, before we take any questions. Muj, over to you. Before we begin the Q&A, we would like the participants to take a short poll. We would like to know, based on today's presentation, would you be interested in have, having someone contact you to discuss your project needs or schedule a demo? Thank you for everyone's responses. And now I will be handing it back over to Pavinda and Jeff for Q&A. OK, we had a few general questions that uh, we didn't address in the presentation. So I'm going to start with those. If you have any other questions, please be sure to put them into the Q&A uh, box on your screen. And we will uh, address them now. So the first one, Parvinder, is um, about the member segmentation. You mentioned the eight sub area for the pushover analysis. How to know where to subdivide the areas as the plastic hinge can happen anywhere which the designer does not know about before carrying out the analysis. So essentially okay. saying, where are the where are the joints uh, or where are the segmentations uh, generated before the analysis? The segmentations are all done internally. Uh, you know, the user just says, OK, take a member or any member uh, in your model and subdivide that into a certain number of sub-elements along the length of the member. You, the user really doesn't have to, I mean, provided you have enough sub-elements, the hinge can form anywhere. And so you know, you're not really concerned about placing this in as you think something might happen. The idea is to capture uh, whatever is going on anywhere along the member line. So you don't have to worry about being able to predict what's going to happen where. As I sort of said, there are, there are programs out there which limit your hinge formations to the ends and the center. And of, of course, there you know if you, if you do that, you have a, a structure and you trying to determine the failure mode uh, you're basically predefining it by restricting the hinge formations at these three points in it per member. With seg letting the program segment the member uh, automatically into a number of equally spaced sub-elements, uh, you know, we, can, we can basically have to have plasticity anywhere. Yeah, Parvinder, I think your audio is um, kind of dropping out again. Uh, okay, but so I'll, I'll just recap real quick. I did hear it, essentially the, the members are segmented equally with those 8 to 20 sub areas. Um, and essentially what we're doing is you know, providing more segments than you need to ensure that you can grab the, you know, the or simulate the plasticity along the length of the member. Correct. So, so the, the goal there is is um, is not to design it for plastic hinges at certain locations, but just to capture them where they occur. Correct. Um, so I apologize for the bad internet connection that we have here. I think um, fading in and out. Yeah. Um, next question: What is the overall deflection limit when uh, doing a pushover analysis? Uh, someone recommended two meters for overall deflection. Is that correct? 
When you do a pushover analysis, basically, uh, I, in my experience, there hasn't been a serviceability uh, limit on that. The idea is to make sure the structure survives. Uh, you know, I, that's a new question to me. In other words, what we, uh, during the days when I used to design structures for a pushover analysis, we'd load it with a 100-year wave. If that survived, we kept loading it with maybe a 1,000-year wave or a 5,000-year wave until the structure either collapsed or the wave hit the, uh, the deck itself, in which case we said, OK, this is your uh, extreme, uh, the load maximum load it can handle, and you worked out your RSR from that load. Right, and Pervinder, it's, it seems like some, another user responded that saying that two meters is a, uh, right. looks like a building, commercial building uh, serviceability limit. Um, yeah, typically, I mean, you're either going to get, <laughs> with a two meter deflection, you're typically either going to get collapse or you're going to get some sort of uh, instability that causes yeah, con convergence uh, issues at that point. Right, uh, with, and I'm glad we really, have really this conversation here in, in that too. For a pushover analysis, there are various approaches. There's one train of thought that says, OK, we'll go for the peak load. And prior to that, uh, attaining that peak load, you might get a number of member failures. Now, what that kind of... Uh, that approach omits is the fact that if you get a failure of a member as you're loading it, what happens, it jumps from one stable configuration. It suddenly, it's the structure will suddenly move from uh, one position to the other, another position as the load path changes within the structure. And that's a dynamic effect. It's not, it doesn't happen gradually. Now, if you look at a structure which has a huge topside uh, on it, there's a lot of mass which is moving suddenly from one position to the other. It's not going to actually stop there. It's going to carry on moving. So the idea behind achieving a peak load to determine your RSR is kind of not, how do you say it, very conservative because uh, in between you can get large movements due to member failure, which will also input inertia load into your structure, which is not accounted for. And that inertia load might be sufficient to just push the structure over prior to it, prior to it reaching the peak load. So another approach when you do a pushover analysis is to just go for the first failure. And that is more conservative than trying to reach the peak load. All right. Um, so next question, is there an example for each of these collapse analysis, analysis types from Bentley? Uh, and also, can STAD Pro do the dropped object analysis? Jeff, I bet you can answer the STAD Pro bit. Uh, regarding examples, uh, we can actually provide you these examples if you need them. Start a I'm not sure whether they, I'm not sure they are there. Right. I, I believe yeah, all of sure. the samples I believe all the samples are provided in okay. the, when you install SACS. Um, just checking right now, there's a dynamic in, uh, in ship impact analysis, sample 17, dropped object is sample 18, dynamic blast analysis is sample 19. Uh, so you have these when you install SACS in your installation directory the um, samples okay. are available there. Right, the um, only thing I would say folder. is the ship impact uh, analysis may not have a meshed uh, impacted member. So that's, that's the only provision. Right. There. But it's, it's, the sample is given there yep. to show you how to run the analysis. It's not a, the modeling portion is not in there. Right, and uh, in regards to STAD Pro, I don't believe that you can do uh, a, a, like a dropped object analysis in in STAD because of it's a dynamic analysis. So um, I'm not an expert in STAD Pro, but that's that's my understanding of that problem. 
So um, if you if you do have some questions about that, though, uh, I would recommend going on to uh, Bentley Communities and posing your question there. Let's see, um, and um, let's see. Is there any training that we can that you can do in the UK? And I, I can go ahead and answer this one. Uh, yes, you can get uh, on-site training um, anywhere in the world. Uh, it's something that you should contact your account manager about. So if you're interested, um, please contact your account manager. If you don't know who that is, uh, you can find out from your uh, whoever is your contact person at your company to get in touch with those people, and they can set that up. Okay, let's see. We have a question. Um, how do the enhanced collapse uh, and results compare I, to USFOS? I don't know, but what I am betting that it's probably going to give you a lot larger deformation than USFOS can predict. And again, I think uh, I, I basically used to use USFOS. Uh, a lot in my past career and again you're going to have that limitation I think, do believe USFOS only allows plasticity or plastic hinges to form at the ends and at the center of the member so in essence you are basically predefining your failure mechanism even before you start the analysis so uh, I would imagine there are differences largely because we don't confine the plasticity to the extreme port and so the member in the center and, and you know we actually allow it to spread along the member as well and I don't believe Busfos does that yeah and I just like to add that you know there's when you're talking about a nonlinear analysis like this um, you know it's it's very difficult to make sure that every input is exactly the same and that you don't get any kind of divergence. So usually the best way to compare um, those types of analyses is through benchmarking as opposed to trying to make sure everything is apples to apples the same. It's, uh, it's quite difficult. Yeah, as a matter of fact, so, you'll never be able to set up um, the same behavior in OSFOS as you collapse. It's literally impossible because we don't have that restriction on the location of the hinges. Right. Okay, uh, I got a question. I can take this one. It says, please summarize again the SAC's approach to meshing finite elements as I couldn't hear during that part. Uh, yeah, so essentially what Parvinder was saying is that you can create a portion of your mesh out of plate elements and then you can uh, use the tools in SACS to propagate those elements in either direction, you know, essentially creating a an array of those elements. And that's the recommended practice for doing that sort of thing. Um, we also have some joint meshing capabilities that, um, you know, we're developing to improve a lot of the, the non-tubular meshing tools that we already have. So depending on what kind of thing you're trying to model, there's a few different tools regarding that. Right, and, and Jeff, uh, when we do a ship impact analysis, uh, oh, of course, yeah. one of the other uh, criteria is that the main in joints on the structure, if any, there's any joints that might be impacted, have to survive. And again, part of the reason why we developed initially, why we developed the meshing capabilities for joints in SACS was to basically allow for a nonlinear analysis of an impact on a joint. Similar to what we've done for members where you allow for local indentation by meshing that member, you could do the same for joints as well. Okay, we've got about 10 minutes less left for questions and we've got lots of questions, Parvinder, so let's, we're going <laughs> to have to start running through them. Uh, how about uh, recommended values of strain hardening and collapse. I believe SACS has a, a default value for strain hardening, um, but Parvinder, yes. do you have any other comments? It's, it's, it's a 0.2% and uh, you can go from anywhere but between 
two to point three point I, I sometimes even put you know up to point four but somewhere along those uh, you would really have to look at your material to uh, yeah I was gonna say that's material dependent so yeah. you know it's you're, you're really gonna have to look at what your material behavior is to model that correctly um, let's but, see but but it's essential that you put something there Mm. And the reason for that is if you don't have any strain hardening, what that means, as soon as you get plasticity, you get zero stiffness. And if you have a stiffness matrix with a zero in there in the leading diagonal, what you'd get is you get a singularity uh, in, in the matrix and your analysis is going to diverge. So the idea is to you know, actually model the material as you would see in reality and not to put a zero strain hardening there. That, that's the recommendation. Um, here's a question. I, I'm going to state the question. I think that I need to interpret it a little bit. It says, does SACS have instrument to identify boundary between buckling and collapse? And I believe what he's trying to say is, you know, how do we know we have a, an instability versus plasticity or material nonlinearity? in SACS? Uh, the basic theoretical approach, uh, which is you have a stiffness matrix and a geometric stiffness matrix, uh, as soon as there's any instability that's automatically accounted for now, uh, we don't actually pick up with this elastic buckling or inelastic buckling. It's just buckling uh, either way. And and the way that you would see that is you would see that the stiffness of that member basically drops suddenly when you get that buckling. But there, there, there is no, how do you say it, uh, flag that we point at, pick up and say, hey, this is elastic buckling, this is inelastic buckling. Right, it's all considered it's together. All, it's all considered together, yes. Yeah. Um. Let's see. Oh, and uh, he follows up with, how do you see it? I guess he's asking, you know, how do you know if something's buckled or if it's plastic? Um, I guess that's generally the question. What, what, yeah. yeah, go ahead. What, what, what yes, I, would, please. I would do there is I would view it in collapse view. And what I would do normally do is I actually increase the deflection factor there to not a huge number, but a a reasonable number. So as soon as something buckles, you'll actually see it visually uh, on the screen. Now, in the current collapse, where there are some indicators where we try to pick up a loss of stiffness in a member and flag it, but that doesn't always work. It depends on how the member fails. Right, and I, I wanted to also point out, I mean, it's um, it's not just a simple, you know, okay, this buckle, like you said, you can have you can have uh, material nonlinearity, you can have you know plasticity occur and have the member buckle. So it's not like a binary thing. You can you can have both of the things occur and it's not really you it's not a simple um, you know Euler buckling, you know, completely elastic buckling for like a member. You know, this is considering everything at the same time. So sometimes you will have a messy view of here's some plasticity and the members buckling or you might have kind of a series of members buckling you know because we're looking at it globally uh, the entire behavior of the structure okay um, this uh, question says if you do not subdivide the member will it give a conservative or non-conservative output could give you an unrealistic uh, output. So, uh, you know, if you if you don't subdivide it, it's going to assume it's a single element. Uh, either the whole thing goes plastic, or the whole thing remains elastic. So it's not going to give you a, a good answer. The idea yeah. is to actually. I mean, I I would run with a default of eight. That'll save you doing anything and. Uh, better answer than having zero sub uh, sub elements along the member. Okay, uh, I got a question. 
I may not have had enough time looking at the load deformation curves for old collapse and enhanced collapse, but was enhanced collapse showing a higher load capacity before instability? If so, why? Uh, it, I do believe it's, it's the same. Uh, it's not a higher, it's about the same uh, load capacity as the new collapse. The only thing it doesn't do, it doesn't actually uh, show the unloading. Right. Now, that there, there may be small differences, and that's largely due to the fact that we've implemented new iterative schemes in there. And that's all residual stuff in there if you do see some difference. Okay, is there any possibility to perform ship impact and post impact with the same model in one run? Correct. Uh, then that's basically what we recommend is to apply your impact load and as soon as the impact is, the energy is absorbed, collapse will automatically unload your structure from that impact load. And then the next, uh, your next uh, load, in your load sequence is your wave load, your extreme wave load, or 100 year wave load or whatever. And then you can actually do the post impact analysis to make sure it survives. Now, a lot of, um, I, I know some users who prefer to do a, a code check afterwards uh, to ensure that the, the for the post impact analysis, the only problem there is how do you code check something that's gone plastic? It's, you know, you, you can't do it. Uh, so that that's the only, issue I have with code checking after you've done an impact analysis. So the idea is to do the whole thing in one go. Impact the member, impact your structure, unload it as soon as the impact energy has been absorbed, and then apply your wave load afterwards for the post-impact analysis. And uh, that's all done in collapse. And if you do it all in collapse, you have all the residual stresses that are going to occur once you unload the structure from the impact load. Though those are all with, uh, in your analysis already. Uh, if you take the deformed shape and do a separate coach, uh, static analysis on it, you're going to lose the residual stresses uh, in, in that structure. So right. yes, I, I would do everything in collapse, the impact and post-impact impact analysis. Okay, um, I'm going to take this next one. Uh, it says, I presume the pushover also considers the P-delta effect. Yes, all of our collapse analyses can in consider uh, geometric nonlinearity. So that includes your little P-delta, you know, the, chain, the displacement over the length of the member, and also displacement of the p big P-delta, the displacement of the member in relation to the, you know, your gravity loads and things like that. Okay, let's see. Um, so, um, one question, another question that, you know, have we compared USFOS to um, uh, enhanced collapse? And I think we've already kind of covered that. Um, let's see, um, another question about training. Uh, is there any public training, not on-site training in the UK? I'll take this one. Um, so there's uh, some live uh, training that's uh, occasionally available, uh, but also we provide, um, we do a special interest group every two months, which is like a kind of a free uh, event where we have training. It's not really training, but it's a, you know, it's a consideration of special topics. So if you're interested, you may want to look at that. Um, uh, we can we can of course set up uh, online training with you as well, and again you can contact your account manager about that. And Muj, I know I'm I got a couple minutes, so I'm going to try and get through these last couple ones. Yeah. Um, let's see. So let's see. Again, comparing Usfos to SACS, you know. If you're saying that you're going to get lower RSR values compared to SFOS since it allows for larger displacements, I'm not sure that's necessarily correct. 
I mean, it's, like, I, like we said before, it's very hard to compare apples to apples, and the best way is to look at benchmarking for those results. Yeah, you definitely, um, with an assumed failure mode, as in those spots, you can't, you can't guarantee what sort of answer you're going to get. It's going to be right. lower. Uh, um, what Collapse tries to do is try to predict what's going to happen physically, in reality, to the structure. Pre-assume the failure. Um, okay, one question. What is a good contact for SAC-specific questions? Uh, I would recommend going to uh, communities.bentley.com. Uh, I don't know, Muj, can you put that link into a chat for everybody? Um, that's a great place to put questions that are not tech, like not support-related questions. Uh, if you have any support-related questions, you can contact, uh, set, support, submit a support ticket uh, through uh, connect.bentley.com, and that's a great way to um, to contact us for anything that's really specific to you. Um, let's see. Okay, I think that's it. I know we had a couple more uh, questions, but um, if you have any questions, please go to communities.bentley.com and ask them there, and we can get to them uh, through our forums. And so I'm going to hand it back over to Muj. Thank you for all the questions. Bye-bye.